here at FAIR. I will be your moderator for today's webinar, and should you have any questions during the presentation, please use the chat window in the toolbox on the right-hand side of your screen. Uh, I'll answer those as we go through and moderate those, and if we, have, we, have, we should have some time at the end to uh, answer some questions um, from, the, uh, from our speakers today. As a reminder, this webinar is being taped and will be available on the FAIR website in about seven to ten days, as all of our uh, webinars uh, are. So today's speaker is Dr. Ruchi Gupta. Dr. Gupta is Associate Professor of Pediatrics at Northwestern University's uh, Feinberg School of Medicine Center for Healthcare Studies and the Anne and Robert H. Lurie Children's Hospital of Chicago, where she also serves as a clinical attendant. Dr. Gupta's research and clinical interests include childhood food allergy and asthma and their management. Dr. Gupta has more than 40 peer-reviewed publications and multiple funded grants. As well, she's a parent of a child with food allergies, though her work has greatly impacted her day-to-day -day life. Without further ado, I will turn the presentation over to Dr. Gupta. Thank you, Mike. It's my pleasure to be here and to talk to all of you about uh, multiple things, as you can see on this slide. We have a lot to cover today. I'm going to talk to you about uh, the prevalence and variability of pediatric food allergy in the United States. Uh, I'll explain a recent study that's hot off the press on uh, the prevalence of hospitalizations and hospital visits, ED visits, among children in Illinois and how um, the demographics of that is changing. And then we'll talk a little bit about the economic impact of food allergy. Um, then we're going to get into quality of care. So the quality of care families receive from their physicians. Um, then we're going to get into quality of life. So uh, the impact that food allergy has and some new research that we've done on this. And then finally look at parental empowerment and how that relates to the quality of life. So so lots to do, and uh, I guess without further ado, I will get started. So we're going to start with the food allergy prevalence. Now this data was from a study we conducted of 40,000 families across the United States, uh, and what we found was that 8% of children have a food allergy. Now that's about 1 in 13 school-aged children, or about 2 in every classroom. And among these children, we found that 30% were allergic to multiple foods. Now, this is the distribution of food allergens that we found from this study. And so of children with food allergy, 25%, or about 1 in 4, have a peanut allergy. About 1 in 5, or 21%, have a milk allergy. And then you can see it go down 17% with a shellfish allergy, followed by tree nut, egg, finfish, wheat and soy. Now this slide is interesting because it shows the distribution and we have six of the allergens up here, peanut, shellfish, tree nut, milk, egg, and wheat. And what it looks at is the distribution by age. So as you can see in the young children you have a high percentage of peanut and milk and then as children get older in the peanut category you can see that not much changes kids are holding on to that peanut allergy all the way up into their teen years. Uh, for shellfish, you see it kind of increased as kids get older, probably because they're trying it more. Tree nuts, similar to peanut. Uh, and then milk and egg, I want to talk about these two because these are the two we usually consider happen early and kids tend to grow out of or develop tolerance to as they get older. And we did see this with egg. If you look at egg, you have about 15% in the young age and it slowly declines. And as they hit their teen years, only 4% had uh, continued with an egg allergy. Milk, however, you see that high number early on, 31% at 0 to 2, kind of does decrease as kids get older, but 18% of kids who were teens continued to have a milk allergy, which starts to make us think that this is an allergen that kids are not growing out of as frequently as we thought. I'm going to talk a little bit about disparities. This is one of the what we don't know and need to do more research on. But it's really interesting to me uh, how food allergy um, demographics work compared to other atopic diseases like eczema or asthma. And so in food allergy, you know, we tend to see it more in mid to high income um, 
white children and Asian children. And what we found in our study, the large one of 40,000 children across the U.S., was something really unique. So these are the percentages of food allergy by race. So as you can see, Asian was high at 12, almost 13 percent. But black children had almost 15 percent reported food allergy. And then that was followed by white children. Hispanic children were still the fewest, with 8 percent of Hispanic children reporting a food allergy. Now, although black children reported this higher rate of food allergy than the other groups, they were 25 percent less likely to be diagnosed by a physician with that food allergy. So they, what this means is they said their child had a food allergy and they had the correct symptoms, what we signs and symptoms, which we asked them for the food that they said their child was allergic to. However, they had not discussed it with a physician. Now, this is disparities by income. And so in our study, we found that children of households with less than 50,000 had lower rates of having a food allergy. And they were also almost 50% less likely to be diagnosed with a food allergy. So as you can see the distribution here, you know, about 8% less than 25, and then 25 to 50,000, about 10%, and then it went up as income went up. The next thing we did is we took these kids and we had their zip codes and we kind of plotted them across the United States to see if we could see any kind of geographic trend in is less than 5%. And then as the colors get darker, uh, the food allergy prevalence rates increase. So you can see. And in that time period, there were about 16, 1,700 almost emergency department visits due to food-induced anaphylaxis in Illinois in children. So these graphs, what they show you are uh, the number of hospital visits by year, but ED is in red. It's the first graph to the left. I'm sorry. A little difficult. I hope you can follow along. But um, on the left-hand graph, you see the red line going up drastically, and that's emergency department visits by year. The blue line below that is hospital visits or hospitalization, so kids that required a hospitalization for their food allergy. And that's increasing, but at a slightly slower rate. Now, the graph on the right shows you the average annual percent change. So what this is showing is that emergency department visits increased by 28% per year from 2008 to 2012. So this is the annual rate of increase, which is significant. Now, hospitalizations also increased 18%, although it started out low and it, you know, is steadily climbing. But this is what we typically see. Children with food allergy you know, definitely uh, have visits to the emergency room after an anaphylactic event. However, not all of them require a hospitalization. Now, this graph is one of my favorites. So this is fascinating. Now, this gets back to the disparities that we were talking about earlier, where we're trying to better understand how food allergy presents you know, by sociodemographic factors. And this graph on the left-hand side, you can see you have Asians, black children, white children, and Hispanic children. And you can see the highest um, rate is 
Asian children, followed by black children, then white children, then Hispanic children. And this is for hospital visits. And then if you look at the right-hand chart, you can see the annual rate of increase. And what's really striking here is you see Hispanic children, which have always had the lowest uh, percentage of food allergy, and their annual rate of increase is 47%. So although they have a lower number, a lower prevalence, a lower rate of visits to the hospital for anaphylaxis, they are increasing at the highest rate. So they're catching up. Now, you also see the Asian children, you know, having a lower, the lowest rate, but they're at the highest, you know, to begin with. But you see black children and white children very, very close. Like, they, their um, numbers are very similar, and then their annual rate of increase is very similar. Now, this graph shows private insurance versus Medicaid. So this goes back to the income data I showed you earlier with from our prevalence study showing lower prevalence in low-income children and a lower rate of diagnosis. And this is showing uh, similar um, conclusions, similar findings, with private insurance having higher rates um, than Medicaid. But on the right-hand chart, what's fascinating that you see is that children on public insurance, on Medicaid, had a 40% annual rate of increase uh, for that five years. So again, their rate of increase is much higher um, so slowly they are too catching up. Now these are the most common allergens that we found uh, causing children to visit the hospital for anaphylaxis. So it was peanut, tree nut, thin fish, and milk. And we also found that the average length of stay, if they were to be hospitalized, was about one and a half days, which makes sense. Um, typically, a food allergy anaphylactic reaction does not require a lengthy hospital stay. Okay, we're going to go into now economics. So what is the uh, national economic impact of childhood food allergy specifically? In this survey, we asked families um, not only all their costs, but we also asked about willingness to pay. So I think this is a really unique part of the study that I want to talk about. We we, this was the question, so what if you could purchase a completely effective and safe treatment to eliminate all food allergies for your child that would allow him or her to safely eat all foods? Imagine this, that this treatment was a pill that needed to be taken by your food allergic child once per month. What is the most you would be willing and able to pay out of pocket per month for such a treatment? So I'll explain to you um, the results from this, but also how uh, this validated some of our findings. Now, the other questions we asked were about direct costs. So this first one slide is on direct medical costs. So these are visits. So visits to your physician, your pediat pediatrician, your allergist, you know, some pulmonologist, nutritionist, alternative providers, and then emergency department visits and hospital stays. And how you would read this is the main um, the main numbers to read are the cost in U.S. dollars and look at the child column and the overall annual in millions column. So what you see here is per child uh, the total direct medical cost was about seven hundred twenty four dollars. Uh, now overall in you know for all children in the United States that um, was about four point two million dollars uh, just for these visits to uh, physicians and to hospitals. Now this next slide, we asked families uh, about out-of-pocket costs. So what do you spend money on yourself, you know, out of your own pocket uh, for your child's food allergy? And so these were some of the responses we got. So some were visits to the physician's office and emergency room, but co-pays, et cetera, overnight stays in the hospital, um, travel to and from, but then we got into epinephrine auto injectors, antihistamines, other prescription or non-prescription medication that your child may need for their food allergy. And you can see uh, in the cost per child, they weren't very large numbers. So like epinephrine auto injectors, about $31 per child, antihistamines, 32. I think these numbers were lower than what I personally spend, but um, they were uh, not incredibly high. So other prescription, about $36. And then that equated to the numbers in millions, you know, nationally that you see in that last column. 
Now I want to get to this slide. So then we talked about non-traditional medicines. Um, this next number I really want to point out. This was the cost associated with special diets and allergen-free foods. So this is significant and it's very different than other chronic diseases. It points to other things that families need to spend money on. And this was about $285 per child per year, which I personally think is slightly low, but it equated to about $1.68 million a year. So I think that was the most significant uh, dollar amount that people were spending out of pocket. The next most significant uh, included child care. So, you know, change additional or change in child care, adding that to special summer camps or a change in school was needed due to food allergy. So, you know, those expenses added up come out pretty similar to the special diet food, which um, I think any family with a child with food allergy can attest to. So overall, any out-of-pocket cost for families was about $931 a year per child or $5.5 billion, or a million, sorry, $5.5 million a year. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. I, did I say million? I didn't mean billion. $5.5 billion in the direct medical cost. It was in billions, too. My apologies for that. All right. So now this was very interesting. Um, this was opportunity cost. So this is the cost of a career change. So, you know, a choice of career had to be restricted. A job had to be given up. A job was lost through dismissal. Job change was required. Any job-related opportunity cost basically is what we were trying to get at because in a lot of our focus groups, this came up over and over again that, you know, we need to, someone, one of the parents or a caretaker needs to be there with the child at school or be available in case of any um, emergency, any accidental ingestion. So this really did um, affect families' lives in terms of uh, being able to work in the type of job they would have otherwise worked in. Um, a lot of people couldn't take jobs that required travel. Many, when their children are young, wanted to be in the cafeteria during lunchtime. A lot of these things were discussed. So we thought we would ask the question and assess what the costs associated with it were. Um, and what's so interesting is this was the highest cost that parents reported, totaling about $14 billion a year and about $2,400 per child per year. Okay, so this slide is um, just a summary slide. So now I'm going to show you the willingness to pay. That first question that I showed you that was talking about how much would you be willing to pay uh, to pretty much get rid of your child's food allergy. And the number for that was $20.8 billion total, or $3,500 per child per year. Um, now, what was so interesting, I think I have, about that number was that it was very similar to this number. This number is the reported costs that families said they have. So this is what um, families were saying they spend on their child's food allergy per year. And they are almost identical, which really made us believe that these numbers were, were true. Um, and then adding in the direct medical costs, you get a total cost in the U.S. for food allergy of $24.8 billion per year. And that equals about $4,184 per child with food allergy. Okay, now we're moving on to a totally different topic. We're going to talk about quality of care for children with food allergies. So another thing we heard a lot in our focus groups um, was about the quality of care they receive. Um, families felt that oftentimes physicians were not managing them appropriately um, and were concerned about this or testing them appropriately. So we wanted to um, better understand this. And in our focus groups with physicians, especially primary care physicians, we found similar concerns that, you know, they this is a new um, condition for them. It's not something they were well trained in during training, and they didn't feel very comfortable um, dealing with it. And management steps to take. With allergists, obviously, you know, it was a different issue. All children with food allergies should see an allergist um, to get proper care, but oftentimes, you know, pediatricians or family practice physicians are the first line. And for many children, the only 
care that they can receive. So it was really important to really understand um, what steps they were missing and how we could improve upon it. And another study that we're currently working on is to develop a clinical decision support tool for physicians to improve care. Um, but for this study, what we actually talked to families um, and asked them about the care they were receiving. So, uh, basic, so the role of the pediatrician. So pediatricians need to be adept at managing food allergies. They're often, like I said, the only physician certain children can access. And in one study, we found that the average wait time to see an allergist can be as long as four months in an urban center. And I can tell you in our clinics here at Lurie Children's, in our primary care clinics, we definitely see this. Um, had two kids uh, just this week who I referred, and it was um, their appointments are in July. So there is a long wait, especially for kids with public insurance in urban centers. Um, Patient-practitioner relationship is so important. Uh, food allergies impact both physical and emotional health, and um, it can be a complex relationship, but must be trusting, uh, good communication, and that will definitely improve um, care and management. So when we asked parents, and this was an interesting study because we asked both mothers and fathers of children who had a, children with a food allergy. So the mothers responded on a separate survey and the fathers responded on a separate survey. But what we found was mothers and fathers typically did agree, and I'll show you some of the differences we found, but overall they had um, very much agreement in how they felt their physician handled their care. So this is a, um, some numbers on basic um, satisfaction and trust in their physician. So the darker blue is the allergist, the lighter blue is the pediatrician, and as you can see, all parents really felt that they were treated with courtesy and respect, they were listened to carefully, um, their views were respected, and their physician had concern for uh, the impact of food allergy on their life. So these numbers were very high, which is wonderful. This is what we want to see, good, um, respectful uh, patient-physician relationships. The next thing we did is ask about food allergy management. So. Did your physician explain food allergy? Still pretty high, a little lower for pediatricians. But then we got into, did they explain when to use an epinephrinado injector? And you can see that drop off. You know, almost 30% of allergists did not, and almost 70% of pediatricians did not. And then when we got into explain how to use the epinephrine auto injector, we were getting 50% of even allergists not doing this, and you know, about 80% of uh, pediatricians. Again, provided a written plan. Everyone needs an emergency action plan. It's critical that you have this with your child at all times, and only 50% or so of allergists were giving it out and only 80% of pediatricians, and then explained long-term prognosis was low as well. So that was interesting and concerning, but what is nice about it is it gives us areas to target when we now go and work with physicians about their management of food allergy. Now, this is what I was talking about earlier, about fathers and mothers. Um, so fathers were more likely to respond favorably about the care that their child received. And you can see these numbers. The dark blue here is mothers. The light blue is fathers. But as you can see, it was not a huge, significant difference. So parents of children with food allergies feel cared for and respected by their child's doctor, which is excellent. Proper management of food allergy by both pediatricians and allergists are, is very critical. Uh, increased education in the healthcare setting around recognizing symptoms of an anaphylactic reaction, how and when to use an epinephrine auto injector is what is needed, and we must encourage that all physicians give a food allergy action plan and counseling of prognosis. All right, so now we're going to get into quality of life in caregivers of food allergic children. Okay, so we all know that food allergies impact quality of life in a variety of domains. Family relationships, finances, social interactions, schools and daycares, and many, many more. You know, this has been documented and talked about, um, but we wanted to do something a little bit different, which I'm going to get into now. Um, but going back, so one in four parents report that food allergy causes a strain on their marriage. This is from one of our previous um, quality of life studies. Poor quality of life is more likely if a child has been to the emergency room for food allergies in the last year. 
if they have multiple food allergies or if they had a milk or wheat allergy. That was the, yeah. Okay. So why, the biggest area that parents, all parents said, no matter what the food allergen, no matter how, you know, how, um, what the severity was that food allergies impact social interaction. And uh, yeah, I completely understand this, and I, I think many people on the phone probably do too. So many people do not believe that food allergy is a serious problem. Still today, this can lead them to resent children with food allergy, especially when their own child is directly affected. Quality of life among food allergic families varies widely, with one exception. Caregivers are consistently troubled by social limitations. And I think this comic says it all. So food allergy parents are so dramatic. My child could die. But banning peanut butter at school totally ruins childhood. So, you know, oftentimes we do encounter some opposition when um, trying to advocate for our child. But I'm hoping, you know, FAIR is doing a ton uh, of awareness around this. And, and I think the awareness campaigns are helping and things are improving. And a lot of the data that is coming out is also helping. Um, the situation. So caregivers of children with food allergy express the greatest concern when it comes to school and daycare. Ninety percent of schools report enrolling children with food allergy, with half of these schools reporting a food-induced reaction in the past two years. One in four kids have their first reaction at school. Um, and just following up on the, the school piece, you know, with that, I just want to put a plug in for support of it and fair support of it. Okay, so now we'll get into the parental empowerment and quality of life study we recently conducted. mothers and fathers. You know, one interesting thing uh, we found, we did separate focus groups with mothers and then a separate focus group with fathers. And something that I, I felt was very interesting was that mothers were very concerned and wanted to protect their children um, and not, you know, take any risks or chances. Whereas the father focus group really did appreciate the mothers, but their point was we want to push our children to the limits. We want them to be as, you know, much like other children as possible and do as much as they can and not let food allergy uh, restrict their life. So what we found in those focus groups, whoops, sorry about that, was a lot of um, discussion about uh, different philosophies and how that impacted both the mother and the father. So what was nice about this study is we were able to do a survey about empowerment um, with both the mother and father separately and then quality of life with both. Oops, hold on one second. There we go. So what did we find? So we found that mothers are more empowered than fathers to care for their child with food allergy. Mothers 
also experience worse quality of life than fathers, particularly when the child has a comorbid chronic condition. We also found that parents of children with more severe food allergy are more empowered but suffer worse quality of life. So, and I'll, I'll get into all of these in a minute. So parents of children with peanut, milk, egg, and tree nut allergy report similar degrees of empowerment, yet milk and egg allergy were associated with significantly reduced quality of life. And then overall, parental empowerment does not appear that reduces that quality of life. So I think what's so unique to food allergy, which we really need to put out there, is it's very different than other conditions because it impacts them socially because a reaction can happen at any time. And so that is what is reducing quality of life. So how can you improve it? And the main way to improve it is if we work on awareness campaigns and really get schools on board and, you know, restaurants and groups where our children are to know how to handle um, a food allergy emergency, what to do, and that will hopefully improve quality of life for, for families. So traditional empowerment-based interventions focusing on anaphylaxis management and allergen avoidance are not sufficient to improve quality of life among caregivers of children with food allergies. So this is what we talked about. We are improving it among families, but we need to improve it among communities. Okay, wow. I think I started going fast because I was worried of not getting through it all, and uh, and we're actually actually done. This is um, my team that I want to thank, and uh, we are dressed as some of the most common food allergens in this picture. Um, we did this for a video that we're making for physicians to improve their management. And this is my contact information. So if uh, anyone has any questions that I can't answer in the next, now that we have quite a bit of time, about 20, 25 minutes for questions, if there's any questions that um, I don't get to or if you want to contact me directly uh, to discuss anything, please feel free. My email is um, right there, r northwestern.edu. And Mike, I guess I'm ready for questions. This is an interesting process because I can't see any of you or uh, or take them between slides, but I'm ready ready to take them now. Richie, can you hear me? Now I can. Yes. Okay. So we had. Uh, I apologize, folks, uh, that we lost the last few slides. There, our uh, internet here in the office completely dropped. So actually was very fortunate that uh, Ruchi was off site and could at least continue moving along. Uh, but we had a bit of a catastrophic internet drop here at the office. So I apologize that we are getting the uh, 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 question, uh, Ruchi's information up on the screen. I just one more click. Uh, so Ruchi's information is up on the screen now. It should be up for folks. Um, and we'll take some questions. Uh, so, Ruchi, one of the questions that came in was uh, someone had a question about the stats related to um, uh, in, uh, food allergies that are genetically inherited. So, any statistics you can give about uh, food allergy inheritance or, um, uh, you know, what the statistics are between family members as far as, you know, if one family member has a food allergy, what are the likelihood of another may have it? Yeah, so that's, that's an excellent question. And we actually just um, finished the study, so I'm going to give you a little bit of preview of what we found here, but um, obviously if a parent has it, there's a much higher rate that the child will have it. Now, a big question I get asked is among siblings. So what do you do when your first child has a food allergy? What should you do with your, your next child um, to protect them from a reaction unnecessarily? So currently, you know, we recommend not testing, but we don't have great data on you know, percentages of, of siblings. Um, in a study that we just conducted of siblings, what we found was uh, that almost half of siblings of a food allergic child, so a confirmed child with food allergy, their sibling has about a 50% chance of being sensitized. That means if you test them, they have um, a high percentage, a one in two percentage of um, having a positive specific IgE test to a food allergen. Uh, but when we looked at how many kids had a true food allergy, it was only 13%. So my advice, and I think the most allergists would agree with me, is 
be careful and do not unnecessarily test if the child had not, has not had a reaction to that food because you may very well get a false positive. That test may come back positive and your child may be able to eat the food. But by holding it off, by not giving your child that food, we don't know what happens. We don't know if that would potentially induce a food allergic reaction. You know, a lot of, you know, one of the things I was supposed to talk about today was, you know, what don't we know? And we don't know, we don't have a lot of great data on what happens if we restrict food when a child is sensitized. When you have, you know, positive specific IgE or a positive skin prick test, um, but you're tolerating the food, what happens when we stop that food? Does that mean the child has a higher chance of developing a food allergy later in life? Um, those kind of things are unknown. So from our study, I would definitely recommend not to test unless a reaction occurs because you definitely do not want to unnecessarily avoid the food in your child. Mike? Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, now I can. Sorry, right. continue to have uh, issues here. Uh, we had a question around the numbers. Uh, why do you think the numbers are increasing and the severity of, of food allergies uh, are growing? Any, any thoughts on the theories behind that? Yeah, sure. So this is, again, one of the big what we don't know and what we need to do next. Um, a lot of research is being done on the big why question. So, you know, why is prevalence increasing? Why is severity increasing? Higher hospitalizations, higher um, emergency room visits for anaphylaxis. Um, what's happening in our environment? Uh, obviously, it is, you know, both genetic and environmental uh, reasons for food allergy. Um, but what is changing in our environment so quickly to make this such a growing problem? So some of the most popular, I guess, um, theories include, you know, hygiene, um, the whole idea that as a community we're becoming cleaner and our immune system, you know, especially at a young age is not is not attacking these foods the way, or starts to attack, you know, things that it probably should not attack. And we've seen an increase not only in food allergies, but also in environmental allergies. Um, and so allergies all around. Then, you know, other theories is, you know, how we're eating and our, our gut microbiota, you know, what is what is happening to that based on um, our new diet style today? Uh, and is there a way we can um, restore that in some ways um, through our, through research being done more on the gut and, and the um, microbiota in the gut? Um, other theories, you know, that have much less weight right now are, are not being, you know, as uh, well thought of, but are being studied is just what we eat. You know, is it something with pesticides or, or you know, ways foods are, are the foods that we're eating today compared to how we used to eat it. You know, previously we used to probably eat, you know, homegrown food locally, you know, grown and served. Um, our lives are getting busier. Lots changed in the past 50 years in terms of um, our diets and how we're eating. So there, there are a lot of theories. Nothing is... Um, confirmed as of yet. I think we're doing research in this, you know, on our team here, but a lot of people are all across the country. Other things people are looking into is early introduction. You know, we put off introducing a lot of these foods like peanuts um, and tree nuts especially to children until they're older. And previously, the American Academy of Pediatrics was advising to wait because we didn't really know any better. Now that we're seeing that early introduction may actually prove to be better for the child, um, that recommendation has gone away, and we are we really just don't know. Again, a thing of we don't know, you know, is it better to introduce certain foods at a younger age while the immune system is developing or, you know, hold off? Does that cause food allergies to develop? So, unfortunately, that's a really, really tough question that a lot of work needs to be done in, um, which luckily now with food allergy researchers growing across the nation, Hopefully, we will be able to answer in the next few years. Thank you. 
Uh, another question came in uh, regarding the prevalence of food allergies in other countries. Uh, are you seeing similar rates in other countries, uh, similar allergens uh, that people are allergic to, just any information about the prevalence in other countries? Yes, that's a great question. Uh, Mike, you could probably talk about this. You just went on an international <laughs> trip, but I can tell you what I know, and then maybe you can tell us what you saw. Um, sure. So it's really interesting that we are seeing uh, a rise internationally, especially in the European countries, I would say, more than the Asian countries. However, um, we are seeing more awareness and more discussion around food allergies everywhere. Um, the foods are different. Uh, and I'm I'm excited. I don't, I don't know if I have this up, but we are seeing some foods um, trade places with other foods, depending on what country you are in. Peanut is definitely not the highest in all countries, um, especially some of the Asian countries um, and European countries. We're seeing milk as a as a number one um, food allergen, or you know some other foods that are specific to their diet, including fish or shellfish. Um, it's very interesting, but I think uh, I'm, I'm excited to be part of a, a study that was done internationally um, and FAIR uh, worked with groups all around the world to uh, survey people from, I think, about 20 countries around um, food allergies. And so we're compiling that data right now and hoping to get it published soon so that we really can do a comparison and look at top food allergens in different countries as well as um, as you know, feelings around food allergies in different countries. Mike, do you have anything to add to that? Did you hear anything on your trip? Well, I mean, yeah. When, so when I was in uh, Chile, the uh, the main allergies there, as you mentioned, are, are not so much peanut; is that milk and and soy. So a main issue that you know that that brings different challenges, obviously, uh, especially for parents um, that may not be only be able to feed their child the elemental formulas. So that was a major challenge down there. And you know, while here we're at the point where we have access to those in most cases, but you know there may be issues around uh, epinephrine and other issues uh, down there. Their first step was just trying to get elemental formulas into the country so they had something uh, to, to give their kids there. So um, I, you know the different allergens cause different priorities, and it's interesting to see that in those different countries. But uh, as Richie mentioned, it really depends on the country and where those uh, the, the different allergens are. And you know, as we're working on the college program here at Fair, that's something we're trying to convey to folks as well is you can't just be tied into that top eight allergens anymore, especially at the college level, when you're pulling in uh, folks mm -hmm. internationally uh, from all over the world who may have uh, different allergies. So, um, yes, prevalence is definitely there. It's just it varies on what those the, the top allergens are. Yeah, and I can tell you in our um, prevalence study, we just ran um, the numbers for Asian children for, uh, for a group that was really interested in what were the top food allergens for Asian children uh, in our large 40,000 prevalence study. And um, the one that jumped up higher than other racial groups was sesame. Sesame was uh, a lot higher in that population. So it is interesting to see the unique trends in different groups um, of people. The other thing I was going to mention that I didn't mention during my talk when uh, somebody just asked a question on severity, uh, I do think, you know, in that prevalence study, one of the one of the biggest findings that I didn't bring up was that 40% of kids with food allergy had already experienced a severe life-threatening reaction. So I think as we talk about severity increasing, I think that's important to note that, you know, so many children who have a food allergy have experienced in their lifetime at least one life-threatening reaction. Um, so severity is increasing, which, again, goes to the point of we need to increase awareness. So we have two questions. Uh, the next two are around uh, kind of adulthood issues with food allergies. What are the your your data early on? Some of your slides showed the chances, uh, or I should say, the prevalence of food allergies uh, in children as they got older. Um, do you have any information on uh, if you were to plot that out even further? You know, to age 25, 30, 40, um, any other decreases that you're aware of in some of those allergens? In other words, uh, if someone's 20, you know, they're not they're 18, 19, they're moving into their mid-20s, could they outgrow then, for example, a uh, uh, milk allergy or a wheat allergy? Yes, yeah. So you can outgrow, develop tolerance to your food allergy at any time. What we found, um, what research has shown, is that you have a higher chance of outgrowing them at a younger age. Um, once 
a child goes through puberty and, and you know, gets into their teen years, their uh, chances of outgrowing that food allergy are significantly lower than at a younger age. Um, some, you know, work we've done on tolerance, developing a tolerance, shows that um, kids who have a food allergy at a very young age, develop it early, have a higher chance of growing out of it than if they develop it later. Um, so it's, but again, I, another area where we definitely need more research in terms of better understanding the natural history of tolerance. Like how do kids develop tolerance and who is more likely to develop tolerance and, um, and to what types of foods. You know, the percentages we have are, are good to start, it's, but it's based on, you know, small numbers and observing kids over a period of time. Nationally, and internationally, there's um, a big push for large databases following children. I know we're starting it here in Chicago, where we're just following children with food allergy to better understand, you know, the answers to these questions. The other thing we're seeing, um, as you bring up teens and adults, is um, more adult onset food allergy. Uh, that's become a topic that you know, a lot of people are researching and talking about. Um, you're seeing an increase in the development of food allergy at a later age. So that's a whole other area to look at. But, you know, as you talk about teens turning into adults, there is, and especially for milk and egg, there is still a higher chance that you will develop tolerance compared to the nuts and the shellfish and the fin fish. Sorry about that. Can you uh, hear us? Yes. I apologize for the continued technical difficulties here. Uh, a question was about the uh, rise in adult onset food allergies. Have you seen data confirming that? I can tell you anecdotally here at FAIR, we're definitely hearing more and more, um, uh, fielding more and more questions from adults that have been diagnosed uh, with a tree nut allergy or shellfish allergy uh, later in life. Have you seen any data to, to back that up? Yes, I, there have been several papers. We did a small cohort study here looking at adult onset allergies, and uh, what Mike just said is what we're seeing the most of. It's a lot of fish, a lot of shellfish allergy developing later in life, um, fin fish, and then some more around the tree nuts, peanuts. Um, less milk and egg that we see coming up later in life, or you know, odd foods, foods that are not in the top eight uh, coming up in adulthood. So there is an increase. There is work being done in that area and literature to support that. But that is definitely an, another phenomenon that we're seeing. Great. Uh, there's a follow-up question to something that you had uh, mentioned earlier. You said that uh, you'd ask the question of folks, what's the most you would be willing to and able to pay out of pocket per month for yeah. treatment of your child's food allergy? What was the amount that you discovered? So it was $20.8 billion. Uh, over nationally, which was about, I want to say, I don't know if you can go back to that slide, I want to say it was about 33500 uh per year per child. Um, so it was, again, you know, our survey had a wide range of um, families in it with a wide range of income potential. So it was not, you know, it was assessing everyone and, and averaging it out. So about yeah, 3,500, there it is, um, <laughs> per child per year. So that was, and the reason that was so interesting and the reason we wanted to do that is to validate because saying food allergy costs about $20 billion or 20, almost $25 billion a year is a lot of money. And so when families would talk about, you know, their costs, I think in their minds just they would take that number and translate it into kind of I'm willing to pay this much because this is what I'm spending currently on my child's food allergy. And that's why those numbers being so similar, the 20.8 and the 20.5 that families are spending on food allergy, um, really did make us feel that these numbers were true and significant. Um, I think it's really important to show the nation, you know, what food allergy is costing in order to get more resources to do research, to develop treatments um, for food allergy. Uh, and then to really look at food allergy carefully to see what are the big costs. And so it was fascinating that it was a lot of lost productivity and, uh, and the out-of-pocket costs. What we know, 
you know, special diets or special foods, child care, you know, things to keep your child safe at all times. Richie, uh, one last question. Um, uh, someone was asking basically, you know, what, what costs do you think may increase? So some of the costs you, you listed there, do you think you really put you on the spot here to pr prognosticate, but any uh, potential areas that you think will probably uh, grow in the amount of, of costs to the food allergic family or what may go down over time? Yeah, I mean, for families, it's, it's hard to say. I mean, if we can increase awareness and get epinephrine auto injectors in school and do proper training and have support, support around these kids, I, I definitely think we could decrease that last opportunity. I mean, families should be able to, you know, work and hold jobs they want to hold and not, you know, have to um, give those up, you know, to protect their child in, in public areas, you know, where their child should hopefully have protection there. Um, so I do think that will uh, improve. I mean, I can tell you personally with my daughter um, who's in elementary school with a food allergy, it was very, very difficult for me to travel or to, to go to conferences or go away um, because it would cause me so much anxiety to be away from her in case something were to happen. Now her school has an epinephrine auto injector. They are trained. They know what they're doing. Um, and it makes me feel a lot more comfortable. I, it really, you know, just from personal experience, has changed how uh, how much personal anxiety or stress I have um, with her being out of my care. So I do think that large, large amount, the $14 billion, has a very high potential to go down if we can improve uh, awareness and care in public places. The other cost that I think is really interesting is the special foods. And um, the whole idea, I don't know if people on the phone have heard of the idea of thresholds. So really looking at, you know, all of those may contain labels and, you know, all of the foods that our children are not able to eat right now um, because of the fear of cross-contamination or, you know, a small amount of that food being a part of it and having a reaction. And the fact that most families have to shop at specialty stores, more expensive stores, to get foods that they are sure are safe for their child. I think that has a, a possible, you know, option of going down because the food industry is very interested in changing that. This is what I heard. I was just at the food industry meeting, and they really do want to improve on that, um, but they don't know how. And one of the one of the um, areas of research that is being tossed around and talked about a lot these days is thresholds. So if you knew how much your child could tolerate, how much of any given food uh, micro amounts that your child could tolerate, if you were able to go to the physician and get a threshold number on your child, and if foods were able to label thresholds, like this has less than whatever micrograms of peanuts, um, that could really change our buying habits and how we feed our children and, and what we are able to offer them and really increase variety. So that's another whole talk, but an area that um, is gaining momentum. And, you know, I think it would be really nice to see that happen. Okay. Well, I think that's all we have time for today. Ruchi, I want to thank you so much for a great webinar, for staying around to answer uh, so many questions and for providing your contact information. Again, Ruchi's email address is up there. Feel free to contact her. I know there's some answers we did not get to today. Um, but I want to thank you again for, for being here. Or okay. in Chicago, as it were. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, thanks again. So as embarrassing as it is uh, to talk about yourself for the next webinar, uh, I am going to be doing the next webinar uh, called 15 Million Reasons to Get Educated. Uh, the goal for that webinar is really to talk about, uh, preview the, the first FAIR National Conference coming up in Chicago from June 21st to 22nd, and information on that is on our website at foodology.org slash conference. Um, and the next webinar will really kind of cover all of the, the hidden gems that you may not have seen in uh, all the talks that we have there. We have uh, four simultaneous tracks plus uh, art, music, and dance therapy rooms uh, being put on by Lurie Children's Hospital as well. So got lots going on at the same time, so it would be hard to miss some of the, it would be easy to miss some of the um, amazing things happening there. So we're doing a brief overview of that, but even more importantly, talking about uh, FAIR's vision for uh, education, uh, what we've done so far this year, and what, what we uh, hope to do over the next year or two. So I'll be covering uh, those uh, pieces and um, also doing a little bit 
uh, around Awareness Week, which that will be right smack in the middle of. So uh, for members, uh, registration will open on April the 11th, which is Friday. Uh, and then open registration for non-members for anyone will start on April 21st. So uh, again, thank you again for being a part of this presentation. Uh, if you did not have any of your questions answered, please feel free to email me um, after the fact and we will do our best to answer your questions for you. Thanks again. Uh, again, the recording will be up on our site in about seven to ten days. Um, and hopefully we'll be able to edit out some of the technical glitches that we had. Again, I apologize for the audio drop there for a while. Again, uh, thank you and uh, have a good rest of the week. Bye-bye.